Welcome to my podcast. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Costa Music. Inviting you to join us for conversations with friends, artists, and many professionals in our music world. Today I have the big pleasure of having a great drummer, Graham Lear, join me. And I'm really, really happy to, to be able to have this conversation. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Thank you again, uh, Graham, for uh, joining us. Um, before, well, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, before we get into the um, some of what we're going to talk about, uh, shaping your journey is really the, the, the theme of, of this whole podcast, this whole project. Tell us a little bit about your history, where you came from, and you know where you were, where you formed your musical background, and all of that, and then we can talk about some of the other things. Well, sure. I was born in Plymouth, Devon, England, uh, but I came over as a, a, a toddler, and uh, I grew up in London, Ontario, essentially. And uh, my father took me to when I was about eight or nine. My sister played the accordion, and uh, you know we weren't a particularly musical household, but the music was being played through her and her affiliation with that. And he decided to get me involved, and he took me to the London Police Boys Band, which, although the London school system at that time in the late fifties did not have a music program per se. They filled it but with the local band. So there was a, a lot of very good local organizations going where, where young students could get involved. So he marched me down there to uh, the, the police station, actually in downtown London. And in the back garage in the summertime, covered garage, they had about you know 30 or 40 kids playing brass and woodwind and percussion and you name it. I, I did a test. They deemed that I had ability, rhythmic ability. And they handed me a pair of sticks and a pad, and I went back to the back, and that was my start. And then after that, my dad started me with lessons, which was the smartest thing he could have done, because that was reinforcing and helped my early studies in reading and rudiments. And I, my first teacher was Don Johnson, a, a very good player in the area, and he taught a lot. And uh, he lives in Ottawa now, coincidentally. And uh, retired from the forces, but uh, in those days, is a very good teacher for me. My first teacher, my second teacher was Bob Comber, who he put me with after him, and uh, that really laid the groundwork for you know me getting into my teens and starting you know. So I played a lot of uh, a concert band, and I was we had a junior symphony too in those days in London, Ontario, and so I was doing a lot of reading, not necessarily drum set. Playing. In fact, I didn't even have a complete drum set until I was about 14 because my father kind of held off on, he wanted to buy me the, the, the best equipment. And, uh, you know, at the time of the day, right, the Beatles, it was Ludwig. And um, so I did have a nice Ludwig snare drum, but I didn't own a bass drum or a hi-hat yet. And uh, I didn't even start with that kind of independence until I really got into it uh, later with my first and second teachers. And so once I got the kit, which was around 14, 15 years old, then I really started come home. So, you know, then I got into rock and roll and all the other stuff that was going on, the Beatles and the Stones and, and you know, getting excited about all about, about all of that stuff. But I was still, you know, doing some symphonic work and, you know, a little bit of everything, actually, you know, big band around the town and around the city and. So it was really laid a good basis. So that's that's kind of my early, you know, upbringing. After that, and getting into my late teens was bands, and you know, this, the, of course, everybody kind of wanted to leave their hometown because the, the the goal then with a lot of musicians, if you really wanted to make it, you had to get to Toronto. And eventually, I did move to Toronto. Things started to happen on a different level after that. But that's basically it when I was in London. It was a great city to grow up in and, and have that basis. I was lucky. Right. And, you know, just thinking, you and I first met, I only realized it later, because when I started watching you play, actually, you were with Gino Vanelli in Montreal. I had just moved to Montreal, and I was studying at McGill, and then one of the guys in the percussion department was in playing with Gino. That was John, John Mandel, if I remember correctly. And uh, so I started hearing your band and watching you guys play and became friends then. But I realized that I would met you before, and knew you from my high school days, <laughs> which was funny. 
when you played with uh, George Oliver in The Natural Gas. And it's and that's a funny story for me because as a kid growing up in Ottawa at the time, I think I saw every single band that ever came through and Mandala, George Oliver was the singer. They were one of my favorite bands. With uh Mine too. Whitey Glenn on drums. Remember him? Oh, absolutely oh. I remember him. He's he's on my bio as an influence. Ah, yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was great. I still remember his white double bass drum kit with a Canadian flag draped across it, which was unusual back then. <laughs> it was he was great. Yeah, we were all pro Canadian in those yeah. days. It's still I still are, and I still am. Nice. And and it was really interesting because in my high school days, I was very active. I was playing in a lot of local bands and stuff. And in, when I was uh, in the administration of running my high school, uh, I one of the big things that I, I decided to do when I got voted in the council was to do th this big concert uh, to uh, raise funds for a, a, a cause. And so we got the local local school. The, this was an all boys school, and which which had morale was low. So I said, we're going to pick up the morale. We're going to. We had a great high school band, but that was about it. The football team was doing badly. Uh, morale was low. So I said, we're going to do a big concert. We're going to invite all the girls from the local all-girls school who I had a great relationship that was run by nuns. And so we had this big concert. And I remember hired you guys, uh, George Oliver and the Natural Gas, and you were in the band. And I only remembered later that it was you playing in that band when I saw you Gino Vanelli, all those years. Tell us about the, uh, like, what made you move to, to Montreal with, uh, with that band? Well, it, it kind of happened because um, I, on tour with George Oliver, before it became Natural Gas, we were, it was a, we were in a backing band for George Oliver. In fact, George Oliver, I ended up, uh, he came to London, Ontario to do a weekend, and I got kind of recruited through a local rhythm section band that I played in that needed he, he needed a band. So he added three horn players, one uh, of which was Dave Berman from Montreal. I don't know if you remember that name, uh, a tenor player. So he brought in the horns and that band went on tour in the Northeast United States. Well, we ended up uh, changing keyboardists and bass players in that process. That would have been, you know, winter 69, summer of 70 um brian ray from montreal was suggested because he knew dave berman and dave berman also knew leon fagenbaum who became the bass player who added the really funky great you know rhythmic aspect of the bass and the drums to that band and that band really started developing and then after we got those higher caliber musicians into the band um so there was always the Montreal influence and then we came we finished the tour and so we sort of went back and forth between Toronto and Montreal trying to work as much as we could and so we did spend a lot of time there in fact we did live in Montreal for two years probably 70 71 and that's the time that we came up and did your concert that you talk that you just spoke of and uh so I you know I had a kind of relationship with both and then interesting that you mentioned John Mandel. I had not met John Mandel yet. And didn't even know I would eventually be working with him with Gino, but he was going to the same uh, to McGill, uh, probably the time that, that you were. And I don't know if you remember the name Paul Duplessis. Of course. Uh, Paul, yes, Paul Duplessis um, was, I think, University of Montreal. But, you know, everybody knew everybody in that, that scene. And Paul used to sit in on congas with us when we were playing clubs in Montreal. And that's how I met Paul. And then Paul recruited me to go uh, join in, and join his percussion ensemble, Le Percussion de Montréal. And we went on tour opening uh, as an opening act for Tommy with Le Grand Ballet Canadien. So we, I, I toured with Paul and that was kind of a thing that I went into after that as a result of being in uh, so I, essentially, I had left George at that point, but uh, there was a, a, a kind of a, a progressive connection there for sure between Toronto and Montreal for me and a lot of members in the band. We were a mixture of both, really, is what we were. And, right, and right. we loved it because we loved living in Montreal because the vibe was so great. And, uh, you know, we, we 
we were doing the best of both worlds, really, essentially. So what we're doing there. And we met a lot of great people in Montreal that, you know, I've stayed in touch with over the years, including Paul Duplessis. Yes. And Paul, I mean, Paul was really, uh, really involved in the whole scene of on all kinds of levels. I remember he was auditioning. He was involved in the auditions for the orchestra for Emerson, Lake and Palmer when they were traveling. And, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. He but, was. Yes. But the interesting thing is, like the the whole Gino Vanelli connection. How did that come together for you? Because that band was, I mean, life changing for everybody who listened to. It. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was fortunate. It's just right place, right time. Interesting how th things happen. I have gained, of course, a little bit of a reputation from being around Montreal already, as I just described. I went back to Toronto and was working with George in clubs in Toronto, not really as natural gas because that band had kind of disbanded and, but I was backing George, you know, if he called me. So he called me to, he said, you want to go to Montreal and play your father's mustache? I don't know if you remember that club, which was right across from the old Montreal Forum. Yes, and, a nice club, I and, remember that. Uh, yeah, and I said, okay, sure, love to do that. Yeah, it was a great chance to get back to Montreal again. So we went down there, I think we were playing for one week, because in those days you could play bars for a week. Remember then? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes. things were so different. Uh, oh, and, yes. uh, and I guess through the grapevine, the, the, the Vanelli family had heard about me and they came down one night, uh, one of those nights, and uh, they got, they, they come up and said, you know, the family's over here at this upper table, come on over and meet us all. And, uh, you know, we've got a contract with A&M Records and uh, we're going to put, we want to put a band together. And that's how we met. And, uh, they invited me out to their house in Montreal East. I listened to their first record, Crazy Life, which was excellent. That I thought that uh, Gino and Joe had played all the instruments. And, and, and I went, Gino, okay. Gino was a Gino. Besides being an incredible singer, he was also a drummer, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And he's first, a drummer first, yeah. And I realized that as soon as I heard it, there's just something struck me, and I went, you know, this is something that uh, I, I really need to pursue. I just, I just knew as soon as I heard it. I just, I just heard, you know, the potential of Gino. I just, I was really knocked out by the production and the fact that they had a contract with A and M Records, which not a lot of artists then, you know, or Canadian artists could boast of. You know, there were a few in Montreal, uh, Silkwood, and some others that were, you know, in Mashpacan. They had recording deals, and and uh, but but this was was was. Was, had a lot of potential, I thought, but mainly I, I was really struck by the quality of Gino's writing, you know, and yeah. and the way Joe, the, the way they they worked together. I thought, you know, and they said they wanted to make a band to put a band together and record the next album at A and M in Hollywood, which I knew all about Herb Alpert and A and M. I was a big A and M Records fan. I liked all the artists with them, Joni Mitchell, etc. And Tom Scott. And I went, okay, this is an opportunity that you know I, I just could not turn down. But it wasn't easy in the beginning. I mean, I uh, after I finished that engagement uh, with George Oliver, I my wife moved down from over to Montreal from Toronto, and we lived in their basement for about six months at their parents' house, where the where we practiced. And uh, yeah, we we learned the entire Powerful People record there. By the way, that's when I met John Mandel. There you go. I, he was the percussionist. And uh, that was it. We did that. And then we went to, uh, by, you know, summer of, I think, 70, might have been 73. We were at AM Records in Hollywood recording that, that album. Yeah, it's a and great it, album. And it, came out, and it came out and it did quite well. You know, we were very, we, we were shocked in, in a way that how, how fast it kind of got a good reputation. It didn't go screaming up the charts to number one, but uh, powerful. Uh, uh, People Gotta Move was a top 10 single and it started to get things going. Right. And, and, yeah. So that, no, like, that was. Now I remember, like that. Now, I remember the, the orchestration in the band was so unique. It was uh, yourself on drums, had uh, two percussionists mm -hmm. and two synthesizer yes. players, right? Yes. No, no guitar, no bass. And the sound, the, the, the whole uh, concept was just way far ahead of everything and and in fact i i think yes. i heard a an interview once with um um who was it that was said it was gino vanelli and his sound was my biggest influence i think it was um uh oh it'll come to me 
I'll I'll probably remember later. But he was, I mean, the that whole orchestration, that whole concept of so much percussion and synthesizers, nothing else but his his incredible voice, and of course his stage presence. I mean, this and the sound in in, in the hall wherever you guys played was always amazing. Yeah, oh. when I first yeah when I first met with them, they they explained that they wanted to do something different in terms of the configuration of the instruments, and they didn't want to use a standard bass player, uh, an electric bass. And I went, okay, that's you know it's, it's a little bit unusual at first for me. I hadn't done a lot of work like that, a little bit with with B three organists, but that was about it. And uh, yeah, so it was pretty unique in the concept, and and to have you know a concept of, of drums, percussion, and congas. You know, and then the one keyboard was really Richard Baker on organ, and then they concentrated on him doing the left hand bass. So it wasn't really a synth, but he did play organ. And then Joey played the Fender Rhodes and the combinations and the voicings, the way they put together that together was was very unique. So yeah, it was a very special kind of a, an arrangement and they, they really worked with it well, you know, because it's not an easy thing to write for. They they really wrote for that ensemble. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it was Stevie Wonder. That's who I was thinking of. Yeah. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. And he was, yeah, I didn't always use a bass player, but sometimes he did. Another act at the time, probably hadn't quite started yet, was Gary Wright, who did not use a bass player and used all keyboards, but he didn't experiment with much percussion. He just had standard drum kit. So right. still, it was unique for the time. Yeah. And all the, uh, I mean, the, the way it was spaced and orchestrated, and your your playing through all of that was was always uh, impressive. I mean, you were the talk of the town for a while. <laughs> you know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, well, I had the opportunity with that music, you know, and that makes a big difference. But also, I have to give a lot of credit to Gino. I mean, Gino and I worked together on a lot of parts, and and you know, he, he suggested things for me that were very beneficial to me because I. You know, him being the writer and the composer, you don't know exactly the way they hear things. So I would try what I thought. Right? It wasn't always right, you know, and he would help and say, you know, no, no, I want the kit just to play, you know, on two end and, or whatever he said, you know. And, and, and he could uh, uh, verbalize to me, although he didn't write music down per se, I think he, Joey read and arranged music, but Gino didn't, not so much, but he had an incredible ear and an incredible sense of timing um, to be able to write the songs that he did. And uh, so he was a really good influence on me in terms of kind of refining my concept of, because I hadn't recorded a lot before that. I had done one album with Natural Gas. I had a bit of experience, a couple actually in Toronto and, and then the Natural Gas album. But the kind of concept for recording that he wanted, you know, was all was also new that we had to learn it in a way. And uh, so he was very helpful. And if he wasn't a, dr a drummer first, it never would have turned out like that. I don't think. Yeah. You know, to yeah. this day, I look back on it. And, you yeah, know, a lot of that stuff I had learned from playing funk and, you know, listening to Tower of Power and playing with uh, Leon Fagenbaum in uh, Natural Gas. We did some really great funky rhythm parts. So I had a really good concept of timing and what the what the bass drum should play in those kinds of fields. Gino, in a way, simplified it a bit, which he could catch the groove. He had a real knack for knowing what would fit with the song, and that was what was important, right? At End that time, day. yeah, 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 and it worked yeah. really well. After after Gino, I know you uh, you went with um, we're working with. Uh, Santana for a while, right? Yes, yes, 12 years, nearly. 12 years, Santana, wow. Yes, yes. Yeah, 1970, I, I worked with them uh, starting in the fall of, of 76 and until almost 1988. Wow, okay. I didn't know it was that, <laughs> that long. Heck. Yeah, it was a good run. I, I held the record for the longest tenure of any musician in the band for, for that time, at that time. <laughs> And, and since being surpassed, I think, by Dennis Chambers on, on drums and uh, probably uh, Chester Thompson on keyboards, who was there a lot longer. He was probably the longest tenured member. Ah. I'm not sure how long it was. But, uh, yeah, you know, I had that kind of a record for a while, which was pretty, pretty interesting. It's, it's great. And unique. It's, and then, I mean, how did, how did that uh, come about 
working with Santana? Well, after I left Gino, um, I went to LA because uh, and I, I worked with um, the engineer for Gino's records, uh, Tommy Vacari, who was nominated for Grammys, by the way, for those records, um, worked at AM Records. And uh, he said, Come down here, you can stay with me for a while and I'll introduce you to some people. So I did. Uh, I moved down there and uh, for a few months and, and then but visa issues, which always pop up when you're Canada going to the United States, as we all know, uh, you know, kind of raised their ugly head again. And uh, so I came back to Toronto and uh, I was going to start working with Dominic Troiano. In fact, I had done a couple of rehearsals with his band. And one day I came back from rehearsal about four in the afternoon maybe five, and uh, uh, one of the uh, other members of the rooming house that I was staying in, my wife and I, were in a rooming house on, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the street in Toronto, near Yorkville, Hazelton Avenue. That was it. Uh, right near Nimbus 9 Studios, the Jack Richardson studio. Oh, yeah. Um, we were in a rooming house there, and he said, I, got, I have a message for you. You're supposed to call Bill Graham in San Francisco. And I said, Bill Graham, yeah. Of course, we all knew of Bill Graham from the Fillmore East and everything, and uh, you know, famous impresario manager. And I said, "Which Bill Graham? You, you know, who is there a Bill Graham that I know that plays keyboards or something that wants me to do a gig?" No, no, no. He said, "Bill Graham from Santana." And I said, "No, I didn't believe him at first, but uh, it was true." Bill Graham had been apparently because Carlos had asked him to search for me because they were auditioning drummers after Indigo left, and. Uh, they finally tracked me down in Toronto. It took them a while. And apparently Bill Graham had taken it on, on it said to the secretary, you, you, you have to find him. And so once the, his secretary from his office finally tracked me down and found me because I was moving so often, right? In those days, all you had was a landline. Um, they finally got this message to me and he was happy. I called him and I literally spoke to him. And he said, I want you to audition tomorrow. I'm sending you a ticket. They sent me to a, a, a plane ticket to San Francisco, and I stayed there for about three weeks rehearsing with them. And it wasn't even sure because that that I, you know, whether I had the, the gig or not, I I just kept learning as much material and trying to do as best as I could and, and best I could and, and kept going to rehearsals. And they weren't saying no leave. So it got to the point where they had been auditioning a lot of players. And uh, I don't know, I guess it was luck and timing again, because, you know, I was one of the last players that they had. They sort of found me at the very end because it took so long to find me. And Carlos was curious after hearing Gino's records, he really wanted to hear me, you know. And so I just tried to fit in with it as best I could. Chapito Areas had rejoined the band after being out for a few years and had come back and was working with them again. And it was helpful to me because he carried a lot of it for, for the first while until I could learn how to fit in more with the percussion and, and section the way they were, you know, interpreting everything, which was very different than the way Gino did it. And uh, so I just gradually learned over those days. And finally, they, they said, you know, we're going to start a tour in England, you know, in about three weeks. So, you know, you, you've got it. And that's the way it worked. My first gig was at Wembley Stadium, you, you know, uh, with Journey opening, by the way. And, and the, wow. drummer with Journey, wow. the drummer with Journey was Ainsley Dunbar, one of my idols, right? To this day, I, I mean, I love Ainsley Dunbar's playing. He's just a fantastic player. And he influenced me a lot and some of my friends in Toronto growing up as teens because of the great work he did with Zappa. And I went, and they said, oh, I said, who's opening? They said, oh, Journey. And I said, oh, who's playing with them? Oh, Ainsley Dunbar. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just, I went over to an anvil case and started practicing on the top of it because uh, I had to warm up for that big time. I went, you know, but it was really nice. I got to know Ainsley on that tour. It was a long tour. We did about two or three months in Europe all over many dates. It was really fantastic. And uh, Ainsley and I talked a lot on the bus sometimes. And uh, and I got to watch him play every show. And right. that was really good. That was really good for me about learning how to play rock drums 
but rock drums with good technique and, and you know sensitivity and and you know loud when you want to be loud and, and you know good dynamics and and playing to a large audience and how to play with that, that huge PA system which was all new to me I hadn't done venues that large yet because Gino was playing you know 25 he got to about 2000 some 2500 seaters he was still playing a lot of you know, smaller venues, even when powerful people was out. So um, this was a real change for me to go vent to venues like that. And and that was it. That, that, that was my first tour with them. And, and fortunately, that tour got recorded live. And that came out as the Moonflower record. And we decided to do a cover of She's Not There, but the old Zombies classic. And that went top 10 as a single and kind of put the band back on the map a bit because they had had a bit of a lull in their record sales and that kind of, you know, kickstarted them again and, you know, on another level. And I was just fortunate to be part of it. You know, I really was. It was tremendous. Nice. And then from, from, from the Santana uh, camp, you went on to, to work with, um, who was it after, right after that? Um, I did a, a, a tour with uh, REO Speedwagon oh, okay. uh, uh, for a couple of years, actually a few tours, South America. We didn't go to Europe. Uh, we went to Hawaii. We did, did a play for a couple of years with REO. And I got involved with them through the producers that did the, the last Santana record that I worked on. As a matter of fact, it might be up here behind me. That one, uh, Marathon. Uh, was done by produced by Keith Olson and Dave DeBoer. Well, one guy one day I got a call from Dave DeBoer. I was living in LA then, and he said, "You know, the guys in REL who he had worked with a lot um, said uh, they're doing uh, a couple uh, a few nights, like every Wednesday at this uh, bar called Ten Pesos. It was a Mexican restaurant on uh, Ventura Boulevard in LA." And just for fun, they were putting, they had some horns and they were doing some of the REO tunes, but also tunes by the other guys that were, were playing with them. And uh, they said, we need a drummer, so we'll come out and do that. So I started to play these Wednesday nights. And then Alan Gratzer, the drummer at the time, with, uh, of course, with uh, REO, uh, decided to retire. And I, again, right place, right time, I decided, they decided I'd be the logical choice because I had already played some of their songs. And... Uh, that's how that happened. So I just did a couple of tours with them and I finished with them in 19, around 1990, 91. At the time I had my first son was getting older and uh, we decided to move up to Portland, Oregon. So we, we did that because my first wife's family at the time was in Victoria, BC. So we decided to stay on the West coast and move a little farther North, get out of the big city. And uh, I started a new chapter of my life in Portland. Portland, Oregon, up there. I worked locally a lot. I stayed home a lot. And uh, my wife went to college and I helped raise uh, the two boys. And uh, I worked only locally and, and taught at a local music store and just played a ton of local gigs. So that's where I revisited Latin, which was a reformation for me. Because although I had played in Santana all those years, I never studied the legit Latin. Uh, correctly. Well, not correct. I, that's the wrong term to put. I, I just differently. I approached it differently, but I'd never s studied it seriously. And that's when I decided to do that. And I spent all my spare practice time at the teaching studio I was working in. Um, really getting back into those basics and, and setting myself up because I knew that if I had to get to another level, then I was, I was 40, 41. I knew that uh, um, if I didn't really work on my technique and get it back to where it was the previous two decades, that I would be lost in the shuffle because there were just the, the competition was too intense, and there are too many great players out there. And you know, what I learned in the in the business over the years is you you know you have to, as you know too very well, likely that you have to keep sharp and you have to keep at it. And if you if you ever drop that ball. Um, you know, you may not, you know, pick it up again, so, so to speak. So I really worked hard on that. And that was another challenge for my. But it's interesting, the, uh, what you were saying about learning, uh, 
Cuban drumming uh, uh, or, or the rhythm. Uh, it uh, um, was really important. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering yes. if the... Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, well, like I guess... Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I was, I was just Go saying uh, you, you had made a comment when you uh, looked at my book, which really surprised me when you said, now I, I learned something I did not know before closing my hi-hat on two, and you're playing on the cha-cha. <laughs> so, thank you, by the way. That was a nice comment. Because um, I spent like three years putting that book together. Oh, you're after, welcome. After doing uh, all these workshops in Cuba, you know, because I thought, you know, I always tell people, you have to go to the source for all of these things. And once you do, then you can do whatever you want with it. But once you know the foundation, What's it built? What's it made of? Have some degree of control. So the fact that somebody like yourself gives me that kind of comment is uh, very well taken. Thank you. And you're still working on it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Absolutely, I am, and I love your book, by the way. Thank you for that. And it, yeah, I've already I've gone through quite a few things just on conga technique and watching your videos. Not that I play a lot of hand drums. I have them over there, and I have a set of timbales over there. Um, I would play more timbales. Now, I have a bit of a shoulder issue from banging, you know, so hard uh, in the early days um, on cymbals and stuff and stretching. So it's a bit of an issue with me. So I can't play a lot of congas. But like as an example of what you said, just on drum set, converting over to, you know, the right field, putting the guiro onto the left foot on the hi-hat, you know. I was not stopping and used to stopping in an eighth note. I was, taking, you know, really playing it. Uh, I guess you could just call it, I mean, it works. It's a non-traditional sense, though, but the traditional sense, which is what I wanted to really know more about and, and always do, you know, that made a difference. So one eighth note, closing one eighth note sooner, you know. But also another thing that I was talking about with uh, Mark Kelso, a friend of mine who came over and visited me a couple of weeks ago uh, from Toronto, who's a great Latin player in, in Toronto, and you may have heard of Mark. Yes. Um, yeah, tremendous guy, Carlo, yeah. tremendous player, you know, and he, we were we were playing, I was playing some congas and he was playing my kit, you know, and I said, by the way, you know, like, what, where where do you put clave and songo, you know, and he, because I had tried it both ways and I was playing left foot clave with songo, you know, three, two and two, three, you know, but yeah, I didn't know again, exactly what was the traditional sense according to Changuito. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know well about and you know so you know in that respect and then finding out about your cosa uh you know junkets to uh cuba you know, i just wish that i had had the time back in the days when i was so busy to be able to attend one you know because that would have really you know dovetailed with what i was doing you know in my in my 90 in the 90s in portland before i moved back here and you know but to expand on what you're saying i mean you're right it is you have it, it, it's all about you know, the roots and, you know, you have to know where it all came from before you can really play it. Legitimately, uh, is that the right word? Uh, no, there's been some great players who don't, you know, know that maybe have studied that, but it, it was very interesting to me. So as an individual, I just wanted to, I'm that type of person. I want to, once I find out something, Thing and start looking into it. I just want to go back a little bit into the history. And when you go into the back, back into the history of drumming, well, as we know, you can go a long way. You know, sure. yeah. you know. Hence, I've got a, a rhythm right here that Mark Kelso turned me on to a bakwa, right? Yeah. Which I know a bit about because yeah. it, I've, I, I have had a bata trio here with two friends of mine in Niagara on the Lake Ontario, of all places. We get together once in a while and do play bata. Nice. And, you know, so I know nice. from some of those 12-8 rhythms from Bata and how they can be converted between 4-4 four, four and 12-8 that you, uh, it, it's very, very deep. And, and that just leads you back to thinking about what you just mentioned, more of the origin, you know. And where do the origins go back to? Do we really know? Yeah, I mean, there's Africa, there's India, there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of back. Uh, but but the way they get translated also into other cultures is really interesting. You know, yes. I, I, I had this yeah, sure. I had this conversation with Changuito, who is himself not a, a trained musician, oddly enough, but he's such a a fountain of information and knowledge that is 
beyond. I mean, I honestly think he has a direct line somewhere because it's impossible for somebody well, he to... Must. You know, honestly, I've, I've heard him do some things where I stop and I, and I said to my friends, you know, the guys in my group once, we, we were playing on the same stage and I turned around and I turned to them. I said, I am lost. I have no idea where, that's, where that is. I can't see it anymore. And I said, am I alone? <laughs> so they said, no, you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> You're not alone. You're never alone. And it, no, no. Yeah, but and sometimes funny, it, to you it can seem like you are for sure. Yeah. No, because you're totally Everything lost, and you say like, "Where, where is, where is he? What is that? Where is, where is that coming from?" And honestly, I saw him do things that just totally uh, put me on another plane, lost in the fog. And then I had this, that conversation with him not too long ago. Actually, I said, "Where?" Are these things coming from? He says, they're just, they just are. And he says, you know, because he gave me the blessing on the book. And I said, before I publish this book, I want you to go through it completely. I'm going to sit down with you. And I want to make sure that everything I'm saying, all the musical examples, all, all of it is okay by you. Because otherwise, I will, it will not feel good. And, and so that we did that. And, and then the book was published. And then and next time he looks at me, he says, you have to come down here, and I have to sit with you. I have many, many more things that you need to write down and you need to publish. So hopefully I, have, I live long enough to be able to do it, and, and that he lives long enough to be able to do that, because he's a, a total fountain of, of knowledge of, of things that I don't know where they came from, you know, Africa, but beyond. Really interesting, and he's a great drummer. Great drum set player, also. Oh, oh I, I imagine he is. Yeah, although I've not seen his videos much, uh, but I'm, yeah, he has to be. Uh, and, and in in my book, Graham, I have uh, one example. I took a, a drum lesson with him once, and I recorded it many many years ago. So when I was doing the book, the whole songo, he showed me this one songo variation on the drum set, which I couldn't do at the time. I had such a a hard time getting my head around it. And it took a long time. So finally, when I was doing the book, I said, I'm going to learn this the way he showed it to me. And I did. And I transcribed it. And it's in the book, actually. So, Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm <laughs> going to go look at that, too. Another thing to look at. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So after, wow. after uh, Oreo Speedwagon, what, what else uh, did you do right after that? Musically. Well, like I said, I, I just worked locally a lot with people around the uh, Portland area, did a lot of recording and, and a lot of live gigs and uh, worked with uh, Patrick Lamb, a sax player who was doing kind of some smooth jazz stuff and there were a lot of great local artists, blues, uh, Brazilian influenced pianists and Latin influenced pianists and uh, uh, just a little bit of, of jazz with a Russian pianist, which was straight ahead jazz, which was fantastic. Andre, and I'm not recalling his last name now, shame on me, but he was great. And a little bit of everything. I worked with Tom Bergeron, who was uh, a prof professor at Western Oregon University. He had a project called uh, Clovis, CL. OVIS that was released on his label that uh, had professors from all over the country contribute individual pieces that we recorded at a studio out there um, and uh, near the Columbia River, beautiful setting. I mean, so it was, so, it was, it was such a great diverse uh, scene there that uh, you just never know knew what you were going to get thrown at you next. You know, one day it would, would be traditional blues. The next day it would be a pianist saying, you know, have you heard this latest thing by, uh, 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 you know, like, you know, the, the, the latest uh, uh, jazz Latin pianist. And then the next, you know, you, you just never knew what you were going to get. So it, that was challenging, but I enjoyed because I was studying all those things and relearning them all in a way and, and learning new things that I hadn't been forced to learn through being in the previous bands I was in as great as they were. And as great as those 10 years were and what they taught me, I still realized then that I had more to learn a lot more to learn. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, to realize that my sons, so my wife had finished school and was out working and my sons were getting older and I could, 
maybe put the feelers out for, uh, uh, you know, see what's out there and tour. I had a lot of time off the road. So I thought maybe it was, you know, a time to do that. And I, I went and started going through my ABCD Rolodex file and I got to D de Blasi and I got Joe de Blasi who worked with Gino a little bit back in the day and was quite a well-known session player in Los Angeles in those days. And I said, Joe, what's, uh, just called him up and I said, you know, is anybody looking for any uh, players out there? And he said, well, I've been working with Paul Anka a lot over the years. And he said, our drummer's about to leave and we're looking for subs. And I went, okay, there it is, the right time, right place again. I went to Las Vegas. I auditioned after a, a concert one night at about one in the morning with the entire band. They liked me. Uh, Paul Anka came out, introduced himself to me. Said, okay, you got the gig. Well, I started subbing. And then and then Steve DeStanislaw, a great player who was a LA player that was doing it then, um, showed me the entire show. Basically, he was very sweet about it. He showed me, gave me a two track cassette with the drums on one side and the, the audio on the other side. And then I just learned the whole show. It was so easy to do. And uh, he eventually left and I stopped subbing and became a regular and I ended up doing that gig for 25 years. 25. Wow. Which was amazing. Something that I really never intended to do. My intention in the beginning was, okay, get back out on the road, get a feel for it again. And oh, interesting, uh, Paul Anka was not the kind of artist I really kind of thought of at first uh, that I would ever work with, but I knew it was really well known, and again, a Canadian icon. I went, okay, there's a Canadian connection for sure. And but he's he was, a, he was from you know, Ottawa. Yes, exactly. <laughs> your your hometown, and obviously he's a great writer and had hits in all the decades from the '50s up until then. That was the '90s, and um, I went, okay. But the most thing that intrigued me the most was I had not done much big band playing a lot, and had worked with a lot of full horn sections and I knew I'd have the opportunity there. So I, I jumped at it because this is great. And I got a lot of experience there and it was something, it was a one, another facet of music that, you know, I thought I just needed to work on more. And uh, that was a great opportunity. So I did it, but I had no idea, Aldo, that I would be there for 25 years. You just don't, you know, you just don't yeah. realize it at the time, but, but that's what happened. I ended up moving back to Canada uh, met uh, my current wife in 06 and moved back here in, in 08. And I've been living in Niagara on the Lake, right where I am now, up, you know, until now. And, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm really happy to be back. I, I really always thought that I would uh, retire in Canada for sure. I just ended up doing it a little sooner. Right. Well, a little sooner. I mean, you're you're still young, right, Grant? <laughs> so, well, and, I'm not and you're so in wine country, <laughs> right? Well, you know, I guess I you could say I feel young because you know I come down here and I attack the drums like I'm still uh, 30, 35. But you know, I, I I feel it at night when I go to bed that I'm not thirty five. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 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 Amazing, and, and you know, but. Uh, yeah, it's so again, and I'm not, basically what I'm doing here. Interestingly, is now that I'm off the road, I I, I finished with Paul Anka when COVID hit in March 2020. I was on tour in Florida with him, and I came back, and I just felt like the right thing to do because I that was a lot of road work that I did, and a lot of wake up calls at three and four a.m. in the morning to go to the Buffalo airport from here, which was the way I did it. And uh, I thought I think uh, it's time to hang that up. And uh, and then I just started working with a lot more people here. It's like kind of a throwback to what I did in the 90s, moving to Portland, Oregon. Now I am playing more locally with people here and back in this more diverse setting, you know. So that's what I like. And just as an example, I just got a last minute call a few days ago to play to sub for a friend of mine who just got COVID, by the way, um, to fill in for him uh, tomorrow at a blues jam. So tomorrow at 6 p.m. I go to play traditional blues. So uh, interestingly, my wife is a big blues fan. And uh, I went and got a lot of her CDs when I first moved here. I went, I'm going to pick all the best blues drum grooves. And I'm going to put those, 
into my iTunes file, and that's going to be my blues file. And I'm going to listen to all those drummers because I, you know, we all love to play the blues. It's the basics, right? It's the basics for a lot of stuff, and especially on drum set in New Orleans. And I thought, okay, I'm going to really look into this because there's a lot of great feels there that I had not bought or listened to over the years because it just wasn't something I really got deep into. And I so I pulled that out yesterday and I did oh, a good two hours because it's probably about an hour and a half set list of all the best going from the traditional, traditional blues, like the, the way they record the originals up to Stevie Ray and all the, the modern versions of blues and just start including some Zydeco by, uh, who is the Zydeco artist? I'll think of it. Um, not Clifton Chenier, but that kind of stuff, you know, where you're playing fast tempos at about 162 on the metronome, you know, and you're going, oh, okay. And you go, okay, I haven't played that fast for a while and that hard. But not that I'm, they're going to make me do that tomorrow. But again, you never know. <laughs> at, my, at my age, at my age, you know, you have to, you have to keep it up, you know. So that was challenging. And I felt it last night when I went to bed. <laughs> but it was a good feeling it was a feeling i felt like i played a really really hard gig it was was sweating you know it's, it's you know as you know when you get really get going and things get really really hot and and the, the rhythm is just cooking you 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 push into it and and you feel that you know and whether you're you know in an ensemble in cuba doing it or whether you're playing to blues here getting warming up it, it's it's the same thing and you get that and what i realized when I, I got that kind of young energy again which is just it just revives you you know i mean that's that's the amazing power of music really and and drumming but especially drumming i mean i get it because that's my of course that's what i grew up with and that's what we all know and love but but there's just some sort of an energy from drumming you know so i went so i i alternated between Yes, through my blues repertoire and rhythm that Mark Keldo gave me with right hand playing clubbing. And I went, oh, okay. So that kind of twisted my mind. It was left brain, right brain, and whoa, I don't know where I'm going here, but it was good. Yeah. No, but it's 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 interesting. I mean, any anybody listening, I I I'm sure they would agree that. It keeps our minds sharp. It keeps us uh, at heart young, and and just just a feeling of connecting with people because it, it is an instrument of communication. I mean, uh, it both in your mind and your body, just engage. You know, yeah, and that's yeah. A, and that's a fantastic uh, thing. Absolutely. Yeah, but listen, I wanna yes. I wanna thank you, uh, Graham, for spending this time and sharing your thoughts on shaping your journey. And I mean, we can go on for days, I'm sure. And, and you know, we'll, we'll continue the conversation, but I want to thank you for joining us. Today. I hope, thank you very much. I hope, look forward to continuing it anytime. Thank you, Aldo. To be continued. Thank you, Graham.